This bizarre chemical reaction is called the Pharaoh's Serpent, and it's by far the most dangerous, but also the coolest, of all the different carbon snakes. Unlike most other carbon snake demos that use sucrose along with sulfuric acid or fire, the Pharaoh's Serpent uses the incredibly toxic mercury 2 thiocyanate. Now, before I get started making this weird and very toxic chemical, I want to be clear that every step of this process deals with extremely poisonous mercury and should only be attempted if all appropriate precautions are taken, and if you have the means to dispose of any mercury waste produced. Not only is mercury an acute and cumulative poison, it's also extremely dangerous to aquatic life, even in very small amounts. Now, to make some mercury thiocyanate, I begin by measuring out 4 milliliters of elemental mercury. This is around 54 grams of mercury, and way more than I intend to use here, but I decided given how scary this stuff is, that I'd dissolve a lot all at once so I could use it for multiple projects. Anyway, I next pour the mercury into an Erlenmeyer flask, along with some nitric acid. The nitric acid will immediately begin to dissolve the mercury, forming scary red NO2 gas. The reaction going on here takes place in two steps, and in the first step, mercury is oxidized by nitric acid, forming mercury 1 nitrate. Mercury 1 nitrate is far less soluble than mercury 2 nitrate, and will actually crystallize if I allow this to cool as soon as all the mercury is done dissolving. However, to make mercury 2 thiocyanate, I need mercury 2 nitrate. And so to further oxidize my mercury 1 nitrate to mercury 2 nitrate, I simply add more nitric acid and slowly bring the mixture back up to a boil. The applied heat will cause mercury 1 nitrate to disproportionate to mercury 2 nitrate and elemental mercury, which will immediately react with excess acid and repeat the process. With that being said, as long as scary red NO2 gas is being produced, there's still some mercury 1 nitrate hanging around. And once they do finally stop, it means I've finally made pure mercury 2 nitrate. Now at this point, I had almost exactly 100 milliliters of my mercury 2 nitrate mixture. And given how much mercury I started with, this means I should be right around 2.7 molar. I poured about half of this into a reagent bottle to use for some other projects, and then I poured the rest into a larger 500 ml flask. I then went ahead and rinsed my reaction flask a few times with distilled water, and this was done to remove any residual mercury nitrate, and to somewhat dilute my final solution. In a separate beaker, I next dissolved 27 grams of potassium thiocyanate in around 125 milliliters of distilled water. The dissolution of alkali thiocyanates is extremely endothermic, and this causes the temperature of the mixture here to rapidly drop. In fact, it quickly gets so cold that if you look closely here, you can see water begin to condense on the outside of the beaker. Anyway, once all the potassium thiocyanate was completely dissolved, all I needed to do now was slowly add it to the mercury 2 nitrate mixture. The moment the potassium thiocyanate comes in contact with the mercury nitrate, a dense white precipitate of mercury 2 thiocyanate will begin to form. This is a not so simple double replacement reaction, and it's driven forward by the low solubility of mercury 2 thiocyanate relative to mercury nitrate and potassium thiocyanate. However, as you can see here, if I begin to stir the mixture before all of the thiocyanate has been added, the white precipitate will quickly redissolve. While I'm not really positive why this happens, it seems clear that the precipitate will only form long enough to be collected once a stoichiometric equivalent of thiocyanate has been added. Knowing that the compound won't form if insufficient thiocyanate is added, it might be tempting to use the thiocyanate in excess here. However, mercury thiocyanate will also quickly dissolve in excess potassium thiocyanate, and this is due to the formation of the complex anion mercury 2 tetrathiocyanate. As a quick historical side note, since I got a lot of footage of this, mercury thiocyanate was discovered first by Frederick Wohler in 1821, and in a very similar manner to my procedure here. Soon after its discovery, it began being sold as a pelletized firework in Germany called the Pharaoh Serpent. These quote-unquote fireworks were publicly available until several children explicably ate the carbon snakes and subsequently died. Ever since then, several attempts have been made to try and produce a minimally toxic snake pyrotechnic, with the most recent being made from the energetic tetral combined with resinous carbon. Anyway, looking back at my reaction, once all the potassium thiocyanate had been added, all I had to do now was collect it in my Buchner funnel. And thankfully, it filtered really well. 
I then went ahead and rinsed it once using distilled water and then carefully transferred it to a big petri dish. At this point, I now worked off camera to try and carefully form the wet paste into big clumps that would make for a better pyrotechnic later. This stuff really wanted to make a mess, which was a problem considering how toxic it is, and so this was kind of the best I could do. I decided to go ahead and let these dry for a few days in my fume hood, and once they were totally dry, I did my very best to carefully move the clumps into a few way boats in as intact a state as I could manage. This was a lot easier said than done, as they were super fragile, but in the end, I got a final yield of 34.84 grams of the large clumps and another 9.84 grams of the smaller fragments. This brought me to a total yield of 44.68 grams, representing an impossible 104% yield. Considering 104% is impossible and all, I'm assuming that the yield is nearly quantitative and that my chunks here still contain a small amount of residual water. I felt like this probably wouldn't impact my reaction at all, so at this point, I decided I was good to go. Now, to demonstrate the pharaoh's serpent, I simply took one of my mercury thiocyanate chunks and laid it onto a piece of aluminum foil inside my fume hood. I then very carefully ignited it with a butane lighter and let it go. Almost immediately, a long curling column of yellow soot began to grow from the pellet which itself seemed to now be molten. This kept going a remarkably long time, with the snake seeming to grow magically from nowhere. Now, while this is clearly the coolest step of the whole process, it's actually the most dangerous, and this is due to the different reactions going on here. When mercury thiocyanate thermally decomposes, it'll immediately form mercury-2 sulfide, carbon disulfide, and yellow carbon nitride. The carbon disulfide will next react with oxygen in the air to form carbon and sulfur dioxide, and this is the cause of the distinctive blue flame. Meanwhile, the mercury sulfide will also react with oxygen in the air, forming more sulfur dioxide alongside mercury vapor, and this is the truly hazardous part of the reaction. While most of the mercury vapor will immediately recondense inside the quote-unquote snake, a significant amount of it is also released into the air. In fact, if this reaction is done inside of a closed container, a gray film of elemental mercury will condense to the walls of whatever container you decide to use. With that said, extremely good ventilation is absolutely necessary here, and even in the fume hood, I still wore a P100 respirator here. Another possible hazard here is the decomposition of carbon nitride to cyanogen gas. While it doesn't seem like this is a major reaction here, cyanogen is so deadly that I felt it worth pointing out as at least a possible concern. Anyway, I got a good deal of footage here, which I'm gonna go ahead and let play out. If you wanna go ahead and skip ahead to my attempt at cleaning this crap up, feel free to skip to the time shown on screen.
All right, so here's what I found myself left with after making all those serpents. I tried looking around in earnest online for how to dispose of this crap, and given it such an old reaction, I figured I'd find at least something. While it is entirely possible that I'm simply really bad at looking for stuff online, the best I could find was take it to a disposal center. While this is the likely fate of all of my mercury waste, I was hoping in the meantime that I could figure out some way of either recycling or at least condensing this huge mass of toxic waste. Realizing that I was likely on my own here, I decided that a good first step was to condense this down as much as I could and destroy any possible volatile byproducts. To this end, I began by breaking it up and transferring as much as I could to a 1 liter beaker. Once no more would fit, I added water and mashed it down to make some more space, and then continued adding snake fragments. After a whole lot more mashing and water, I was left with about a half liter of this black paste. To this I added about 150 milliliters of 10% sodium hypochlorite and then brought the mixture up to a boil for about an hour. This basic oxidizing environment will ideally oxidize any sulfide to sulfate as well as destroy any free cyanide. Once it was allowed to cool, I then simply passed it through my Buchner funnel to collect the toxic black mass. The filtrate was perfectly clear, and although my qualitative test seemed to indicate it was completely free of mercury, I decided to hang on to it anyway. The black mass itself is likely composed of mostly elemental carbon, as well as mercury sulfides and oxides. I decided to go ahead and let it dry somewhat, and then put it into a few Ziploc bags until I decide how I want to process it. At this point, even though I don't have my mercury back yet, at least now it was in a far more stable and condensed form. I'll likely come back to it later to try and process it further, but for now I'm waiting to build up a bit more mercury waste. Anyway, that's all I've got for today. I hope you found this interesting, and as always, I want to thank all my members here on YouTube for their generous contributions. Your support is vital and very, very appreciated. To everyone else, if you'd like to see more content like this, consider subscribing, or even becoming a member yourself. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.